Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting here in Madison, Wisconsin. We're so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we're returning to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're back to our study of the book of Numbers within that larger study. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 28. We'll be looking at Numbers 28, 29, and 30 tonight. As always, if you have any questions about class, any comments about the class, Class tonight. If you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. And we're so thankful for those of you who get in touch in those ways. It's always good to hear from you, especially uh, since I can't see you, but you can see me. It's good to have that feedback, and we appreciate knowing that you're there. Uh, but as I said, tonight we're back to our study of numbers. And and tonight we plan on doing a rather brief study of Numbers 28, 29, and 30. And if you've been with us in this series, you know we've been moving rather quickly. I just don't want us to get bogged down in the details of God's people wandering in the wilderness. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and we don't need to be spending two years working our way very slowly through the book of Numbers. There's a lot of other good stuff in the Bible we need to be studying. But we do want to make a review of this in our kind of chronological study over the past uh, year and a half or two. So uh, we're now coming to a section where we have some repetition in this chunk of material that we've already covered at least probably 95% of it in Exodus and Leviticus. So uh, this kind of further explains why we'll be moving rather quickly through this. But just by way of general review, if this happens to be the first class you're coming to, um, the book of Numbers is a book of Numbers. And the book of Numbers, we've got Moses conducting a census of the people. So he's counting everybody and he does this twice. Once near the beginning of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and once toward the end. And so last week we looked at the second census. So we've already had two now, the first and the second. And again, toward the end of their wandering in the wilderness, they just have a short time left. Uh, last week then, we looked at that second census, which means they're right near the end of those 40 years. They're camped out practically across the river from Jericho, and they're now preparing for that transition from Moses to Joshua. So Moses, of course, has been leading the people for 40 years. Uh, he's not being allowed to cross over due to the incident where he pretty arrogantly strikes the rock instead of speaking to it, kind of a... Uh, uh, presumes to know what he's doing there and really when you look at the statement that he made he, he failed to treat God as being holy in the process that was really the issue there um, so pretty a big deal I know a lot of times we look back at, at it today and we're like well you know it doesn't seem fair but uh, really um, you know Moses should have known better at this point in his life so tonight like I said we've got some repetition as God has Moses hit some of the highlights concerning the timing of some of those sacrifices. So we're just going to do a kind of a quick review of this. So let's start tonight just by introducing what we find in Numbers 28 and 29, and we'll do that by reading the first two verses of Numbers 28. So Numbers 28 verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel, and say to them, You shall be careful to present my offering, my food for my offerings by fire, of a soothing aroma to me at their appointed time. Well, several days ago, as I was reading through these chapters again, I kept wondering, why repeat this? And not only why repeat this, but why now? And, you know, we may not have a full explanation of this, and we may, though, have a clue right here at the beginning of these two chapters. Moses, as I said is right near the end of his time as a leader of God's people. And God's message through Moses to the people is, You shall be careful to present my offering. For my offerings by fire of a soothing aroma to me at their appointed time. So this is just one more warning to be careful. So this is serious business. Or as we've noted in our study of Leviticus, worship is dangerous, or at least it can be if we're sloppy with it. If we go into it with a whatever attitude, uh, if we just presume that God really doesn't care how we do things. And I know if we want to try to apply this to our uh, Christian faith today, I think there's a lesson here for those who lead in worship, uh, those who lead public prayers, those who lead the singing. It's not a matter of just uh, throwing something together at the last minute and just winging it, but uh, we need to pay attention to what we're doing. We need to be very conscientious in the work that we do. 
Uh, certainly that goes for preaching publicly, teaching a Bible class, uh, serving the Lord's Supper, leading those prayers, reading Scripture publicly, and so on. That This is a serious thing that we're doing. So if we go into it just presuming God really doesn't care how we do things, that's how we get in trouble. And so as they prepare for this transition from Moses to Joshua, uh, this is yet another reminder that worship is incredibly serious. And then notice in verse 3, he just gets right to it. Say to them, this is the offering made by fire that you are present to present to the Lord. Two lambs, a year old without defect, and so on, if we were to continue in this chapter. And, and then we've got two chapters that continue on like this. Just the uh, details of pretty much what we've studied elsewhere. There's a... A few things here and there that might not have been said already. So, but I mean, for the most part, this is uh, something we've already looked at. So, I just want to uh, break it down here into a number of kind of large categories. In a sense, this is a oh, a bit like the Cliff's Notes version, uh, as we have more detail elsewhere. But by way of review, we've got an outline of the offerings on a daily and then a weekly basis on the Sabbath. Then we move into the monthly offerings. Uh, followed by several that only happen once a year. So we've got a number of feasts outlined for us here. The Passover, the Feast of Weeks, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, which was basically their New Year celebration, followed a short time, I think like 10 days or so later, by the Day of Atonement. That would have been the holiest day of the year. Uh, then following that, we've got the Feast of Tabernacles, where they would live in tents or uh, little shelters or huts for the week. And I think the Jewish people uh, worldwide just went through this a few weeks ago where there were like little tents or huts set up. And of course, in Israel, uh, with what they're going through over there with the attacks on a regular basis, that was kind of a interesting thing that they were doing, even in spite of the uh, war that they're in. And then uh, we do seem to have quite a bit on this last one in chapter 29. But this is just kind of the overview or the summary of what's in chapters 28 and 29. And again, in terms of a practical application of these two chapters, I mean, we're not going to learn exactly, you know, what sacrificing two doves means for us today. I don't think that's it. But I think we've got the reminder just backing up and looking at this, the big picture view. Uh, we need to be thankful that we no longer have to do all this. I mean, this was uh, tedious. It was overwhelming. It was almost impossible. I mean, thousands upon thousands of thousands of sacrifices uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis every year from then on out. I mean, it was uh, bloody. Uh, it continued day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year for hundreds of years following. In order to deal with sin... The people had to offer sacrifices over and over and over and over again, almost continually, almost around the clock. Thankfully, though, the lesson for us is Jesus has fulfilled all of these sacrifices permanently. He is the once for all time sacrifice from here on going forward, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. So I think all of this that we're looking at is really fulfilled in the new covenant through Christ. Well, we're not going to go through these two chapters verse by verse, as I said, due to, the, due to the repetition from Exodus and Leviticus. Um, so I want us to skip ahead just to the last verse in chapter 29. Chapter 29, Numbers 29, verse 40, where it says that Moses spoke to the sons of Israel in accordance with all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And that's how this ends. So the message here is, even near the end of his life, even though he wasn't allowed to cross over into the promised land, uh, Moses still very faithfully communicated what God wanted him to communicate. And I think if we're going to put ourselves in Moses' shoes or his sandals, um, it would have been very easy to say, forget it. I'm out of here. I can't go across the Jordan. This is what we've been looking forward to. If I can't go, I'm just going to leave. But he doesn't do that. He is faithful to the end. And he faithfully communicates what God wants him to communicate. He is a prophet. Uh, he is speaking forth on God's behalf. And that's certainly what he does here. So let's continue. And really, we're going to conclude here with Numbers chapter 30. And we're going to split this one in half. So we'll start with the first eight verses. Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. Numbers 30, 1 through 8. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel, saying, this is the word which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. 
Also, if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by an obligation in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and her obligation by which she has bound herself, and her father says nothing to her, then all her vows shall stand, and every obligation by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father should forbid her on the day he hears of it, none of her vows or her obligations by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will forgive her because her father had forbidden her. However, if she should marry while under her vows, or the rash statement of her lips by which she has bound herself and her husband hears of it, and says nothing to her on the day he hears it, then her vows shall stand, and her obligations by which she has bound herself shall stand. Uh, but if on the day her husband hears of it, he forbids her, then he shall annul her vow which she is under, and the rash statement of her lips by which she has bound herself, and the Lord will forgive her. Well, here in Numbers 30, then, we, we have some new material. I don't think we've seen this before. And let's notice it's all about making vows or taking an oath. And some of the commentaries were pointing out a vow is a positive thing, like I promise to do this for you, Lord. And an oath is more prohibitive, like God, I will not do this. I will not drink wine. I will not do whatever. So there's kind of a yes, I'll do this. And no, I will not do this. So I don't know if we really want to read too much into that. But those are just kind of the difference between those two words, it seems. And, and we aren't given the reason why this information is placed here uh, we are sometimes we have that information sometimes we don't and here we really don't know why this is here however i would not be surprised at all to find out someday that the israelites had some kind of question about this and that god issues a clarification kind of similar to what we saw last week with the daughters of the guy who died they were excluded from the inheritance and it's almost as if god issued an amendment i mean not literally not that there was a mistake in the first law but he clarified uh, perhaps to address an issue that wasn't really addressed in the original law i would kind of think of it as we might think of the book of first corinthians as we're studying in our sunday morning adult bible class throughout that book a number of times paul says now concerning this and then he issues some ruling or clarification then now concerning this and then he continues in the next chapter now concerning this and so over and over again, it's as if they've written him a letter and he's going down and there are bullet points you can almost see uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. So maybe in a similar way, the people come to Moses with some weird question. Uh, there's been an incident and they, they need some clarification about making vows. And so God perhaps is issuing this ruling. I'm not saying this is the way it is. I'm saying that's a possibility here as to why it's included here and not back in a, a previous uh, chapter. So in this passage, notice... Moses explains that God has commanded this. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, he's got to keep it. If he says he's going to do something, he needs to do it. If he takes an oath that he's not going to do something, he can't do it. So very simple. However, notice starting in verse 3, we, we come to some exceptions to this rule. And all of these are aimed at women. So first of all, if a young woman still at home, makes some kind of vow, and her father hears about it, and he doesn't object to it, he says nothing. The vow stands, and she has to fulfill it. However, if her father hears it and forbids it, if he objects to it, um, the young woman is released from the obligation. So it's almost as if dad, as the head of the family, can, can veto a vow or an oath that has been taken by a young daughter. And I, there is maybe some wisdom there uh, that dad has wisdom. He's the head of the family. This may affect the whole family. And so he, he has a right to step in here. Then notice starting in verse six, we have a similar situation, but the woman is married. And so now a little bit older, if her husband hears the vow and he's silent, then he in a sense, is agreeing to this, and the vow stands. However, if her husband hears it and objects, uh, then she is not obligated to fulfill that vow. So as the head of the family, the husband has veto power, we might say. Maybe that's too harsh. I don't know, but in my mind, that's veto power is kind of the way we might think of that today. Um, the husband has the right to stand in and either affirm or deny what this woman is promising to do or not do. All right, let's continue with some similar uh, rulings here. Numbers 30, verses 9 through 16. So Numbers 39 through 16. But the vow of a widow or a divorced woman, everything by which she has bound herself, she shall stand against her. 
However, if she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an obligation with an oath and her husband heard it but said nothing to her and did not forbid her, then all her vows shall stand and every obligation by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband indeed annuls them on the day he hears them, then whatever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the obligation of herself shall not stand. Her husband has annulled them and the Lord will forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to humble herself, her husband may confirm it or her husband may annul it. But if her husband indeed says nothing to her from day to day, then he confirms all her vows or all her obligations which are on her. He has confirmed them because he said nothing to her on the day he heard them. But if he indeed annuls them after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses as between a man and his wife and as between a father and his daughter while she is in her youth in her father's house. Well, the clarification here is that if a woman is a widow or if she is divorced and if she makes a rash vow of some kind, she's got to keep it. There's no way out. And we're not told why this is. Um, I'm guessing the reasoning is that maybe a widowed or a divorced woman is under her own authority. She's probably... Uh, as an older person has an extra dose of wisdom at that point in her life, that's on her, God is saying here. And the other new information here in verse 15 is that if a husband hears his wife make a vow but doesn't say anything and then tries to use this clause to annul her vow at some later date, he now is just as guilty as she is if she tries to get out of it. So he is responsible from that point going forward. All right, so what do we do with this? I know a lot of this seems so strange to us today, and you guys probably have some good thoughts. I wish we could share some of that. Uh, feel free to let me know what you're thinking on this. But personally, I think what's going on here is simply reaffirming the husband's leadership role in his family. And I know we're not under this, we're not bound by this law today, but I think really stepping back from it, husbands and wives should really check in with each other before making big promises to people. So, you know, if I'm thinking about something like signing a mortgage or uh, buying a car, or if I'm contemplating taking a vow of silence for the rest of my life, or if I'm uh, agreeing uh, to take in a permanent house guest, for example, or something like that, um, y you know, here it it's almost as if we really need to check in with our spouse on that. You know, there's some wisdom in not just pressing forward without getting some agreement in the family. And so, as I said earlier, it's almost like the husband has veto power. I think the, the term here you uses, uh, that Moses or God uses is to annul. So he can make that uh, agreement null and void. And so I think that's as a way of protecting his wife and his daughters and really the entire family. And again, I know we're not under the old law. This is not a perfect parallel. Um, but really, I think we've always had the understanding in our family that either one of us should always feel free to kind of hit pause on any decision by saying, you know, I really need to check with my wife on that, or I really need to check with my husband on that. So it's not that we control each other. Um, that's not it at all. Um, but we've given ourselves a way out, I think, in the past. And I think there's some wisdom in that. Um, we're using the combined wisdom of the relationship to make a better decision that we might not have made otherwise. So, you know, again, we're not bound by this. This is not law for us today. Uh, but I think that's just a, a practical aspect of respecting each other. Before I go out and buy a car or before my wife goes out and buy a car, you know, that's a big thing, isn't it? That's an agreement that may affect us for a number of years, and there's a value to checking in with each other. So maybe just a practical thing, uh, maybe some encouragement along those lines. Well, this brings us to the end now of Numbers chapter 30. We're getting closer to the crossing over of the Jordan River. Tonight we've had kind of a brief review of some of the ongoing sacrifices. Uh, right before Moses says to Joshua, tag, you're it, he kind of reinforces this. Then we've had this update on God's law concerning vows and oaths with some information that we didn't previously have, probably as the result of a case that came up before Moses. So this seems to be a good place for us to pause for a week. Next week, we'll plan on picking up with numbers 31, 32, and 33. So we'll do three chapters next week, Lord willing. We're going to settle a score with the Midianites for what they did in the incident with Balaam and Balak, and then we'll also find a few tribes settling down on the east side or the wrong side of the Jordan River. 
and we're going to deal with that next week. And then we'll also find kind of a just quick review of where the people wandered over the past 40 years. A huge list of names and places uh, in, in uh, chapter 33. So, hope you can join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock for that. As always, thank you for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, we want to invite you to reach out. You can send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. Um, as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we're especially thankful for Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, our Passover lamb for all time, offered so that our sins could be forgiven. Tonight, as a result of studying these three chapters, we ask you for a renewed appreciation for what you've done for us. And we ask that the Lord's sacrifice on the cross would change the way that we live. Give us a renewed sense of sorrow and terror over sin. We're thankful for the fact that you've promised to always provide us a way of escape from every temptation. We know there will always be a way out. You've said so yourself. And we pray for the wisdom to find that way out and for the wisdom and the courage to take it. Forgive us, though, Father, when we fail. Help us to do better in the future. We pray for those tonight who are recovering from falls and surgeries and illnesses. And we pray that you would bless them, that they would not get discouraged. We also pray for those who are struggling emotionally, who are having other issues, perhaps with their mental health, and that you would be with them and guide them and comfort them and allow us to reach out in your place as we um, do the work that your son wants us to do. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. Thank you for part making us a part of your uh, family, the kingdom, the church. And we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.